People in medieval times were not so very different from us in many ways, more similar to us than people perhaps think, and they did enjoy the company of animals just as we do. There wasn't a word pet or a comparable word that was used in place of pet to mean a, a sort of whole category of things, but individual types of animal definitely were kept. Pet doesn't arrive in English until the 16th century, and it's peculiar because we're not quite sure where it came from, and it can initially, or possibly even slightly before it means the animal kind, can mean an, an, indulge, an indulged child. So the indulged child is a pet, and then from there the animal is a pet. It definitely comes from the north, but whether it's from a uh, sort of Scots word for small or whether it's actually from a similar word in Gaelic is unknown. If it is from Gaelic, that's really unusual. Very few words come, come to us from the Gaelic at that kind of date. But clearly there's a, a concept there which there really should be a word for. So we have to borrow it from somewhere else, obviously. Most people who own them seem to be either women or monks. Further down the social scale, of course, you don't have the money to keep a pet just for the sake of keeping it, but that doesn't mean there aren't animals around that you care about. And it's very, very gendered. Men have hunting dogs and they keep them not in the house, but out in a kennel. Uh, Richard II was so fond of his greyhound, he let it onto his bed. And that was considered to be extremely unkingly and probably unmanly, except you don't dare sell that to Richard II. But yes, keeping indoor non-functional animals as a man would be considered a very unmanly thing to do, and definitely no man would give a pet to another man. Uh, in the 12th century myth of King Hurler, King Hurler is given a lapdog in, ex in an exchange of gifts from this supernatural being, and he and his men are condemned to wander forever until the lapdog jumps off, because they should never have accepted the gift of a lapdog. That that's immediately uh, taking their power away from them. We still probably think some of them would love some of their hunting dogs, just a little bit less obviously than Richard II. They can't get away with taking them indoors. But when you look at some of their names, you can see they definitely have a sense of the personalities and they care about these different animals. There's a, a Dutch list from 1504 where the names translate as things like Venus and Fortuna, which is slightly weird given that I always assumed hunting dogs were mostly male, but who knows. Um, and some of them are named for the owner's professions of the men taking part in the hunt. So there's Little Hammer, Hammerly, and uh, Little, who belongs to a blacksmith, and Little Spoke, Spitchley, who belongs to a wagoner. So if you consider what the equivalent would be for your career, whether it is calling your dog Little Keyboard or Little iPad or something. And another list is made by the Duke of York in the early 15th century. And it includes Troy, Sturdy, Whitefoot, Hardy, Nosewise, Amiable and Nameless. <laughs> the, the other one. We get on with that one. That one's good at his job and that one's pff, nameless. Rich women, on the other hand, might well keep a small dog. It's really popular and it turns up quite often on noble ladies' personal seals to distinguish it from the seal of their husband. They'd have the seal and then a little dog added to it. And these are actually more valuable than the hunting dogs in many cases. In Scandinavian law codes, the fine for killing one of these little lap dogs was twice that of killing a good hunting dog, provided it had never bitten anyone. Because obviously for your lap dog, you want something with a very calm temperament. Uh, breed wise, obviously the breeds aren't quite the same necessarily, but the papillon uh, seems to date back to that time with the big floppy ears and the Maltese which was known as a Melitaean um, and is a small uh, ball of white fluff, basically. And then there are also small versions of the hunting dogs, um, which have sort of long curly brown hair. But the commonest one is this Melitaean, which is a Maltese little white fluffy thing that uh, fits quite nicely on your lap, about yay big. Anne Boleyn, Henry VIII's Anne Boleyn, had a dog which, he, which she called Perkoy. This is a mangling of the French pourquoi, because it was so inquisitive, always sticking its nose into everything. So it's called why, which I think is brilliant. Uh, when it died, nobody, she loved it so much, nobody did, dared tell her. They actually preferred to tell Henry, and then Henry had to tell her, because no one wanted to be the person to give her that particular bit of bad news, bless. 
in literature, they turn up a lot, often as a love token from a man to a woman. If the man's going away, he will leave a lapdog behind for her to keep her company while he's gone. Uh, Tristan gives one to his alt, which has a magical bell on its collar to banish sadness. And I think there is a sense there that having a dog around is, is good for the mental health. You know, it's good against loneliness. Although in the images, he also sort of represents Tristan himself. In the images, generally speaking, his old is seen clutching the dog like this. Um, they are seen as having mentally beneficial effects and also physical effects. There are um, medical texts which suggest that you should clasp a small dog to your stomach to help against stomach pains, which of course is a small furry hot water bottle, isn't it? So for some stomach pains, actually that's, that might well help and help relax and a little nice warming lap dog. They should be on the NHS, right? We know that sometimes they get brought into church uh, to be used as foot warmers or lap warmers. You can imagine a whole row of very rich ladies with their little dogs keeping their feet warm. And these would live indoors. Um, Henry VIII again says that all dogs are to be kept away from court in kennels, except for some few sweet spaniels for ladies or others, so that the house may appear, may be, sweet, wholesome, clean and well furnished i.e. if we let any other dogs in, the place will no longer be sweet and clean, but the lap dogs can be trained. They're supposed to be not in your bedroom, but a lot of people seem to have broken that. They are often shown, in fact, sleeping on a pillow, a brocade or velvet fancy pillow in portraits, or indeed on the owner's bed. And quite often also in the portraits they have little velvet collars with sort of silver and gold bells. If you're the kind of person who could afford one of these dogs, you're also one of the people who can accessorize your dog. It's like the modern handbag dog, you know? Portraits show them sitting with their mistress, sometimes higher than all of the other women, showing that it's, you know, the, the lady prefers her little dog to all of her friends. Sometimes they're seen sitting when somebody wants a picture of herself at prayer to go in a book of hours. The dog will either be seen sitting in a little posture as if it's praying as well, or it will be deliberately shown sort of chasing a ball to show the uh, dangers of worldly distraction. And when they died, some of them were given their own little monuments, marble sculptures. And sometimes when the owner died, the uh, animal would be also memorialized in sculpture at their feet. It's a convention of the art form to have a, a dog at the feet, but we know that sometimes they do refer to individual dogs because sometimes the name of the dog is written next to them. So there's one called Bo, I think, and there's one called Jack, uh, which are written uh, by the, the dog that is clearly not just symbolic. Within the house, they don't seem to have been fed dog food as such. They were fed on whatever scraps and indulgent treats people had for them, unlike the hunting dogs, of course, who have a very different meat heavy food regime and then they're starved and then they're you know glutted and but it seems they were often fed bread quite a lot which is not particularly good for them um uh, black bread which is from bran and uh, porridge some moralists rail against this they say that the dog should not be given uh milk and white bread while there are poor people starving that could be eating that milk and white bread, but that does also just tell us that that's considered perfectly normal as dog food, which may explain uh, something that the 13th century scholar Albertus Magnus says, which is that rich ladies' dogs almost always die of constipation. <laughs> Poor things. There's a 14th century instruction manual that has uh, the example of a woman who overfed her dogs while neglecting the poor. Again, this is this is bad. And because of this, two small black demon dogs appear at her deathbed and lick her lips so that when she dies, her, her mouth has gone completely black. Don't know what illness causes that, but obviously it's a very uh, dramatic way of figuring out why that's happened. A lot of dogs, if they're not with these noble ladies, they're usually in abbeys. High-ranked nuns, it seems, quite often keep a dog or two. Um, the high rank nuns, after all, are used to getting their way and most of them are upper class ladies, so they're from households where they would have known pet dogs when they were young. The prioress in the Canterbury Tales it said, Of small hounds had she, which she fed with roasted flesh or milk and wastel bread, which is really good quality bread apparently, 
but so weep she if any of them were dead, or if a man smote it with a yard smartly. She doesn't like it if people beat them up, how strange. And all was conscience and tender heart. Of course, there's a worry that these could be, be distracting in a religious context, and that does sometimes seem to have been the case. Uh, in the 16th century Hollingshed Chronicle, it's dogs are accused of being instruments of folly to play and dally with all, in trifling away the treasure of time to withdraw women's minds from the more commendable exercises. Sounds fine to me. There you go. Lady Audley entered a convent. Uh, she was boarding in it rather than becoming a nun. And she said, inasmuch that when she comes to church, there follow her 12 dogs who make a great uproar in church, hindering the nuns in their psalmody, and the nuns thereby are terrified. But these ladies are also often keeping dogs themselves, but obviously their dogs are perfectly well behaved and not a problem at all. William Greenfield, the Archbishop of York, said in the early 14th century that bringing little dogs into the choir in divine services would impede the service and hinder the devotion of the nuns. So this is clearly a worry. Some people tried to ban them completely. The, uh, and indeed all pets, all other animals. The Ancran Rule, which is a, a guide for anchoresses particularly, says, unless need compels you, dear sisters, and your director advises it, you must not keep any animal except a cat. And the cat, of course, would be kept as a mouser at that point. And you're, you're not supposed to build up the same bond with a cat. And we know that some abbesses, when inspection came, when uh, you know, a representative of the archbishop came or something like that, they would hide the dogs so that they couldn't be told to get rid of them and sent away and then whistled back when the bishop was gone. Because otherwise you'd end up with a situation like the poor prioress of Flixton in 1520, who was told to get rid of all of her dogs within the month except for her favourite one. It's like choosing between your children, isn't it? She's only allowed to keep one of her dogs, and that was probably thought to be a compromise, but still very harsh. Harder to say whether poorer people, uh, how poorer people's relationship with their dogs worked. We know quite a lot of them would have kept dogs. It's just they would have kept them for more practical working reasons. Whether sheep dogs, messenger dogs, you could train a dog, you put a, a letter in its collar and train it to go to a particular place. That was doable. There were water drawing dogs who worked at wells. Tinker's dogs would carry the tinker's buckets around from place to place. Turnspit dogs, dogs that you kept primarily for defence and more besides. So having a dog wasn't that uncommon. It's just there's very, very little evidence about how most people felt about those dogs. But knowing dogs and knowing people, it's hard to believe there wasn't at least a certain amount of uh, tickling behind the ears going on when nobody was watching, because you would, wouldn't you? Cats are much more seen primarily as a practical thing to keep around the place, as mousers and ratters. There are instances in which they have a completely different set of associations. They're associated with uh, the devil and with witchcraft, but clearly that's not the only thing going on. Um, Another thing to note, until the mid 14th century, pretty much all the cats in this country were uh, mackerel, uh, grey mottle mackerel cats. The tabby was introduced in the mid 14th century and was initially very expensive because it was a fancy new kind of cat. We rarely see names that they've been given and it's quite often generic. Um, there seems to be a trend in this country that all cats are called Gib. Or, or Gilbert. That's a sort of standard Mog name. There's a cat in, in Burley Abbey who is called Mite, as in tiny. It's a mite of a thing. Um, in the Irish text you get several cat names and I won't attempt to, uh, to pronounce the original Irish and mangle it horribly, but the translations come out as Little Meow, Little Paws, Little Flame and Nettle Grey. Which are all good names for cats, I think. And of course, if we go back a little bit further, we take our medieval back into the early medieval, we meet the wonderful Pangoban, who is a Irish cat in the ninth century. And there's a, a delightful little, beautiful little poem in which the monk is comparing his life with the cats. And it starts, I am Pangoban, my cat, tis a like task we are at, 
hunting mice is his delight, hunting words I sit all night, and goes on in, in that vein. And again, clearly this is a cat that he is fond of rather than just one that happens to be around to get the mice. Exeter Cathedral accounts for a period of 150 years, every week it's written some of one penny to feed the cathedral cats. So they're not just being forced to rely on their own hunting prowess, there is also food being given to them. And some definitely are being played with. Uh, the Countess of Leicester in 1265 bought a cat to keep in her own private quarters, and it seems unlikely she did that just to have her own private quarters ratter. And they are definitely um, observed closely, which you would probably only do if you cared in that, that instance. There's a 14th century text that says, they rush and leap on all things that are to fall him and is gladdened by a straw and plays therewith, and is a well heavy beast in old age and full sleepy. Albertus Magnus similarly says, the cat loves to be lightly stroked by human hands and is playful, especially when it is young. So clearly there is sometimes a, a different relationship going on there than just uh, an, an employee of the person. Another uh, thing that was kept as a pet by ladies was the red squirrel. Of course, we're, we're pre grey squirrels entirely, so all the squirrels we're talking about are red. And again, it was generally kept on a lead uh, with a fancy ornate collar with pearls and golden buckles and all such things. We know about it partly from different marginal Im images in manuscripts, and they're very often shown chained to a little kennel or to a pole, or in, in one case, rather cleverly, there's a, a pole with a little kennel on top, and the chain is attached to a, a, a ring that goes up and down so that he can forage here, and then he can go up the pole and then onto the thing, but no further than that. In the uh, the literal Psalter, there's one a lady with a pet squirrel with a collar with a bell. Apparently, they can be quite friendly and quite tameable if you get them when they're young. Although, they do still have sharp claws. Um, many of them will still bite if they're annoyed. Uh, they hate being on their own, which must sometimes have been an issue. And because they want to keep their own cage nice and clean, they will deliberately poo out the bars. Which you know you can't blame them. They don't want to poo inside their own cage but not necessarily the most convenient thing if you're keeping one in a very sumptuous living room or bedroom. Another weird indoor pet of the time is the, uh, is the monkey. These seem to usually be either some sort of African long-tailed monkey or sometimes a Barbary ape. Seem to be more common in continental Europe than here, but you do occasionally get them coming through. Uh, Hughes of St Victor says that even clerics, particularly clerics, keep them around the house. Even though the ape is the most vile, filthy and detestable animal, the clerics like to keep it in their house and to display it in their windows so as to impress the passing rabble with the glory of their possessions. They would uh, dress them in little coats, for instance. And it does seem to be a thing of the male upper clergy. And they would say that it was a sort of uh, reminder of the... Obviously, this is a long way pre-evolution, but people have seen that monkeys are in some ways like little degenerate men and therefore it can show the uh, the follies and the sinfulness that lies within us all. Um, as I say there are fewer examples in this country but in 1280 the Bishop of Durham had two spoiled pet monkeys who were said to eat peeled almonds from a silver spoon and he said that he kept them not in order to show off as other people had accused but to ease the burden of his worries. And the chronicler who, who writes this says that this was the custom of modern prelates to keep a monkey uh, as a little companion animal. Make of that what you will. In the 1280s, the Archbishop of Canterbury orders the Abbess of Romsey not to keep dogs or monkeys in her chamber. Clearly that's an important addition to the thing. About a hundred years later, the new Abbess of Romsey the abbess of Romsey at that point also gets in trouble. So Romsey does seem to have a, uh, a pattern of pet keeping. And in this case, it's the Bishop of Winchester who writes, some of the nuns of your house bring with them into church birds, rabbits, hounds, and such like frivolous things. And he gives them all a punishment of three Sundays of bread and water. So that also suggests that rabbits are being kept as pets 
and also birds. Now there's not a lot of information about rabbit keeping as pets other than for food and rabbits at the, that era were still expensive rare imported beasts all the warrens were still guarded or on islands and things because it was only the sort of Norman overlords that had rabbits. Birds we can say a bit more about though. Of course if you want the um, the eccentric version you can look at Sir Hugh Bishop of Lincoln around 1190 who had a pet swan uh, which was gentle towards him but went crazy if anyone else tried to come near him and tried to, to uh, scare them off. Which I suppose if that's what he wants from life, fine. Caged birds were a, a variable in, in status. The high status version of a caged bird is to keep a parrot um, or what we what they would call them a poppin jay and in most cases they seem to be Indian green rose ringed parakeets so with a bright green parakeets with a, a red ring around the neck and these were kept in cages they were colourful and exotic and you know they, they were entertaining to watch. In the squire's tale uh, one is described as uh, in, in her cage was straw fair and soft as silk and she was fed sugar, honey, bread and milk, which again is not necessarily a healthy diet for a parrot, but there you go. In the uh, Le Menagier de Paris, which is a guidebook from an elderly Parisian merchant to his very young new wife, uh, he details how to look after caged birds and he says they have to have their water constantly replenished and let carded wool and feathers be put in the aviary to make their nests. And thus have I seen turtle doves, linnets and goldfinches lay and rear their young. You should also give them caterpillars, worms, flies, spiders, grasshoppers, butterflies, fresh hemp in leaf, moistened and soaked. She does give you this vision of this lass who is I think 14, 15, trying to get hold of lots of flies and spiders and um, grasshoppers in order to feed a caged bird, but I uh, don't know quite how that worked out. Um, item spiders, caterpillars and such like things which are soft to the little bird's beak, which is tender. So he's caring a lot there, but I suppose it depends what kind of bird he's talking about as to whether that's necessary. And again, you can go down the social scale because keeping a caged bird is a relatively cheap uh, pet to have if you can't afford to feed a dog, for instance. So people further down the classes seem to keep things like jays and magpies, which could be taught a few words potentially. Or if you preferred a singer, you might keep a finch or a lark or even a nightingale. And those things would take very little looking after and you'd, you'd get their song in your room. So pet keeping isn't just for the rich. In the 16th century, it spreads very much down into the middle classes. Middle class gentlemen start keeping um, various kinds of animal that would have been unmanly um, a few generations before. It's just for the very poor, we only get little tiny glimpses of uh, what's going on and who, who cares about what animal. And my favourite example of this is the thing I'll, I'll leave you with, <coughs> which is uh, from the Miracles of St Thomas de Cantaloupe. And when you have a shrine, they always ro record all the miracles that happened in there to show other people that you know praying at this particular shrine will do you a lot of good. And in this particular set of miracles, there is a promise of a very small monetary offering, tiny amount of money, if St Thomas de Cantaloupe cured my dormouse. And it's recorded in the book that the dormouse was returned to health. And I don't know what the story behind that is, but I love to imagine, you know, it's, it's some kid or some peasant chap that his dormouse is his best friend and um, did he take the dormouse with him or not it's it's hard to say but it's a lovely image so on that note i will bid you good night uh, if you have any pets go give them a, a scruffle as appropriate from me and i will hope to see you all soon bye bye